By default, when you're using forms in HTML and CSS, you get this nasty effect here where this is your default. Nasty blue borders, nasty buttons. We're gonna totally change that up. Here's gonna be our new default right here where you can come in here and click. You get this cool banding effect. You also get the labels moving up so you can remember what you were supposed to type in here. And as you move, they stay up top once you type something in. If you remove all that altogether, it snaps back down. All of this we're gonna accomplish with just plain CSS. And on top of this, we're gonna have dark mode. So automatically we're gonna build this in to where you get this nice dark mode effect. Same thing for the button down here. We're gonna use actually some styling we did in a different video to accomplish this so that we can just focus in on these form inputs. Now, this is totally themable and we've actually set up some global variables up top here. Uh, right here, the hue, the size, the radius, all this that control the look of everything else. So I can come in here and change this to zero hue, which would be like a red color. Change this to perhaps 3.5 and change this radius, I don't know, something like 0.7M. Now everything will dynamically adjust, including the size of the banding, the radius of the banding, the color scheme itself goes to like a red color scheme. I change it back to light mode. It's still red, but now it's in a light mode color scheme. I could come back up here, change this to maybe 300, move this down to 1.5 rem, back down to two. And again, everything just adjusts automatically for me for both light and dark mode. So we're gonna use these form inputs really as an excuse to talk about theming and kind of building out an entire design system with CSS. I hope you'll stick around. Hey, what's up? My name is Chris and welcome to Coding in Public. As we build out this new form, we're gonna do it in two basic stages. First of all, we'll do the HTML, and then secondly, we will do the CSS. So let's go ahead and get started with that. I've just got a blank directory open over here. I'm gonna right click and do new file, and we'll just call this index.html. And then to get started with, we'll do a bang and an enter. That will give me the template that I get with Emmet by default. Let's call this something like uh, building a better form input or something like that. Okay, now with that set, I'm gonna click go live. And the extension I have called Live Server, we'll open this up over here. Let's close this down, give ourselves a little bit more room. And then we're going to be pretty quick with the HTML so that we can spend most of our time on the CSS. So inside here, this is inside of the body itself. I'm going to have a div with a class of container. And I'm just using Emmet to scaffold this out quickly. It comes default with VS Code, and you can get it with lots of other uh, code editors as well. But basically, it allows you to type out all that with just like a dot and a class or something like that and hit enter or tab and it will complete that for you. I've done videos on it in the past if you're interested. Okay, so inside this container, we're going to have an H1. This will say uh, building uh, better form inputs like that. And then below here, everything else will be inside of a form. In fact, this doesn't need a class, so let's just do form like that. And I'm going to remove the action since we're not going to be doing anything with this form. It's just for styling purposes right now. Now, as we think about the form itself, we have that kind of floating label. And so in order to position that absolute, we're gonna need a wrapper around each of the inputs and labels. So I'm gonna create a div here called input uh, wrapper like that. And then inside here, we'll have two things. We'll have the input itself, and this needs to be first. And I'll explain that in a second. And this will have a class of form uh, input. Below here, we'll have a label, and this will point to the ID of the input. So we're gonna have that ID be first name. So let's go ahead and add that here and then I'll come up here and say ID is first name. All right, this ties these two together for screen readers and other assistive technology, and it also helps Google and other things that are scanning your page understand your form. Now, just to make this a little easier to see what's going on, let me go ahead and just put these each on their own line so you can see exactly what we're doing here. So that's the input. Now we've got the label here, and inside this label for this first one, I'm gonna say first name, and then let's go ahead and do the same thing. So I'm gonna break these out like this, and let's see, just like that. Let's add a couple of other things. So for this one, I'm gonna add a class here, and this will be a class of form label, and we'll use that to uh, style how that floats over everything else. And then I also wanna add a couple of extra things to this input itself. So first of all, I'm gonna have a placeholder, and this is gonna say first name. It's the same as the label itself, and I'll show you why we're doing that when we get around to styling it. But basically, we're gonna use whether or not this is shown to trigger how this label interacts with its parent container. And then finally, I'm gonna come in here and do autocomplete. And in here, you can give a bunch of different options that basically will pre-select stuff. So like if you've ever been working on your phone and you click into a form and it suggests that you put your first name there, that's what it's doing. And what we're gonna do is do uh, give a name and that will be your first name. All right, so that's set. Let's go ahead and copy this down. So I'm gonna grab all of this right here and just hold down option and shift and the down arrow and it will copy it down. We're gonna change out a couple of these things. So for this one, we'll grab first name here and that one, but with command D and say a last uh, name, that. And then same thing here, we're gonna say uh, 
last name. All right, now this isn't our given name. Instead, it is, I believe, called the family name. So this will pull the last name if they've got something like that on their machine set and ready to go. And the rest of that should work just fine. At this point, you don't have the drill. We're going to do this again for the email address. I'll just copy all of that down. This will be slightly different because this will be a type of email. And then I will actually change this last name and this one too to both say email as well. So this will be the ID as well and what this points to. And then inside here, I'm going to grab this and this and we will say uh, email. Or how about email address? And then for family name, instead of this, the autocomplete will simply be email and that will pull in their email if they've got that on their system. Okay, we've got just one final thing and that will be our button. So uh, just before the closing of the form tag, I'll add a button here. This could also be an input. That would be just fine. Um, by default, if you don't give this like a type of button, it will treat it as the submit, but we'll go ahead and just do type uh, submit just to make sure it all works properly. And then we will add a class here as well. So let me space all this out just to make it a little bit easier to read. So we'll say class and here we'll have a button. And then I'm gonna add a couple of extra things here in just a second. But for now, all I'm gonna do is come in here to the button text itself. We'll say something like sign in. All right, so here we go. Move this over and I'll save it. And then over here on the right, here's what we got. We've got our first name and the label, last name, label, email address, etc., and the button. So all of that looks correct and it's just as ugly as I remember, so that's perfect. All right, now let's go ahead and move to the CSS and I could be using SAS or something like that. In this case, I'm just gonna write it in standard CSS and I'll let you kind of uh, scaffold it out with whatever you prefer, um, but it's easy enough to do in standard CSS. And really, this is kind of an excuse for thinking through how to lay stuff out and we're using forms and inputs as an excuse for that. So let's come up top and rather than linking to a style sheet, I'm just gonna do it all in line here uh, just to keep everything in the same document. Uh, in the code pin in the description, obviously this will be broken out and so you're welcome to just grab the CSS from that if you get stuck at any point or want to copy some of the values that I'll have in here. All right, so let's start with some basic things. So I'm gonna add a basic clear and I'll just paste this in here so you don't have to see me type this out, but pretty basic clear that we've got going on right now. We'll also do some basic clears for the buttons themselves. So the buttons will inherit the font from the body or whatever the parent is. And then they'll grab a uh, border as none and cursor pointer. And we'll do the same thing for the inputs and the labels where we'll inherit all the font properties from the body or their parent. Now, what I'm gonna do next is add a bunch of values into a root. Now this root here is essentially the same as the HTML, but it allows us to set variables. We're gonna use custom CSS variables. And I think this is really the most important part of this whole video is understanding how you might scaffold out a design system using variables that are built right into the browser. There's a lot of really powerful things you can do with this if you understand how they work. So we're gonna start, and I'm just gonna go ahead and paste these in as well for the sake of time, but I'll let you copy them out if you'd like to, and I'd rather spend my time explaining them than typing them. So I'll come in here, and first of all, I'm gonna add several variables, and these are going to be variables I'll use to control the styling of the entire page. So they're more like um, design variables, I guess you'd say. So we're gonna have a hue, we're gonna write in HSL as far as the color scheme is concerned, and then I'm gonna use this hue value to adjust how the styling of everything looks, all based off of this one hue value. Next, I've got a size. This is my base size. And as you adjust the size, the entire form will shrink and expand to fit it along with all kind of the, the relative units that it will need. Uh, I'll also have a base radius that I'll use for the button and the input form. And that way you can adjust them just with this one single value. And then we'll have a few things for transitions. So I've got like a transition speed fast here at 150 milliseconds, a transition speed slow. And then I've got kind of a squishy uh, cubic bezier curve that I've added in here. You could also just use like ease in or whatever, but to make it a little squishier, uh, that's what I'm gonna do. All right, next, uh, when it comes to actually scaffolding out the design, like the color tokens of everything, we're gonna have essentially two different schemes that we'll use throughout the document. So we'll have our light mode and we'll have our dark mode. So again, let me paste this in and I'll talk you through this. So this is my light mode variables. And what I've done here is set up H, S and L value. So hue, saturation, and lightness. And the hues, they all take from my theme variable up here of hue. And you see that I'm giving it like BG for background, double dash, light, text, light, accent light, and muted light. So those are the four colors I'm gonna use, but they're all based off of whatever color I pass in. Now the saturation depends on how much of that color comes through or how much of it's more of a gray color. 100% saturation would be obviously all that color and zero would be none of it. So you can see here, most of these are somewhere in the middle. And these are kind of just values that I figured out worked pretty well for my use cases. Same thing here on the lightness. We've got very light, so almost white here, very dark, so almost black here, right in between, and really, really almost white. All right, so a super, super white here. 
Then what I'm going to do is come just below here, and now we're going to add in some dark variables. And I did the exact same thing, except for the background here, instead of it being an almost white, now it's an almost dark, like almost black. And then this dark one, uh, or this text one, instead of being nearly black, it's nearly white now. So we just basically inverted all of those. And I found just values that seem to work well, just by experimenting and kind of how I have typically built out projects. So maybe I can come in here and say like light mode, and this can be uh, dark mode, just to keep everything a little bit more organized. And then we haven't yet applied these anywhere. We've just added them as variables that we can reference. So I'm going to come in here next and actually uh, apply these. So what we're going to do is set some kind of global ones we're going to use, background, text, accent, and muted, and say by default it should be light mode. So if there's no preference on their machine, then I just want it to take the light mode variables. So now this is going to reference this. The text will reference the text, etc., etc. And then I've added one more thing, which is color scheme light. Now, the browser has defaults for inputs, for the scroll bars, all of that based on what the color scheme of the browser is. By default, it's light, but we're actually gonna change this to dark when we change to dark mode. So by setting this, I'm telling the browser, hey, when it comes to choosing defaults, use the light variables that you have available to you. And then we'll come down here and we're gonna do something else outside of this route. So everything should be set up and ready to go for the light mode. Now what we wanna do is set it up for the dark mode. Now when it comes to the dark mode, I'm gonna come in here and say media, and inside parentheses here, I'll say prefers uh, color scheme and then colon dark. So whenever that's the case, I want to grab my root again here. And here I'll paste in the values. And what we're going to do is just reset all these. So now background is going to point to my dark and text is going to point to my dark version, accent, etc. And then importantly, this color scheme will switch over to dark as well. So if I go ahead and save this here, just by changing this color scheme dark, this is the only thing that really is going to apply over here right now. If I switch my machine to dark mode, you can see that now all of these things take on a dark hue, and that's because of this one line of CSS right here. You can also actually set this as a meta tag in the HTML as well, but I'm just setting it here in my CSS. If I switch back to light mode, everything should switch back automatically to light mode. And right, now we will want to do one other thing to adjust, uh, which would be to come in here and do prefers a reduced motion, but we'll come back to that. So let's just leave that as a to-do. All right, next, when it comes to actually scaffolding out how the whole thing interacts, let's go ahead and get just some defaults up for the body itself. So here I want a min height to be 100 view height, so it should take up the full height of the viewport. Display of grid, and we'll do place items center, which will put everything in the very center. Perfect. Uh, for my font family, I'm just going to use uh, system UI right here, and this will just grab the default for whatever system somebody's on. Uh, obviously, this would change depending on your typography for your site, but we're just focusing on the input, so let's keep it simple. Next, I'm going to grab my background color, and here's where I want to reference my variables. Now, what I want to do is just always reference my background, my text, my accent, and my muted, and let this determine whether or not it should point to dark or point to the default of light. Now, you may notice something here that inside of each of these, I don't actually have this wrapped in an HSL function. So normally, you'd come in here and say like HSL like this and wrap it like this, but I don't like to do that because this kind of hems me in to just these values. Whereas if I leave it ambiguous, I can actually add some opacity where I need it to be all throughout the document without having to create all of those custom variables up top. So here's what I mean. If I go ahead and remove this here, and let's come back down this way, I'm gonna come down to my background color, and I've got a little shortcut here for HSL wrapping the variable, and in this case, I want it to be background. So I'll go ahead and apply that, and you can see that it's applied that background color. Now just to make it a little bit more uh, obvious. Let's come in here to my accent. We'll make it this like purple color. Now, because I've wrapped this in my HSL function, I can now just come in here with a forward slash and do like 0.2 and add some opacity immediately. And you can see how that makes it way more opaque, 0 0.7, 0 0.9. So in other words, I've got some more flexibility when I'm actually scaffolding out this design. That's how I like to use HSL values all throughout the document. Now, in this case, let's remove that and change this back to background. And that's the actual color that I want. The other default I want is not just a background color, but my color. And this I'm going to set to my text variable. All right, so all the text should be taking on that color. Now, because uh, it's already such a dark color and almost looks black, it's hard to see. But if I just switch this to accent, you can see how that's taking on uh, that color there. All right, next, let's work on the heading. So here, I'm going to say my font size. And in this case, I actually want to calculate based off of that default font size. So I'm going to grab that. So my size 
And let's see, I think this had an underscore to start with, which I typically do with these kind of controlling variables that have major impacts on the design. And I'll just multiply this times like 1.3, something like that. So now it's actually gonna calculate based off of whatever I set up top here. So if I change this to like 1.2, for instance, this will be now 1.2 rem times 1.3, which is the variable or the value that I gave uh, down here in this calc function. So let's leave it there for now. In fact, maybe let's kind of put it halfway between. So let's do something like two rem. All right, cool. Next, after this H1 itself, we've got a container class. So let's go ahead and add some styling for that. And here I want this to be display grid, and I want this to be gap of 1.5 V max. So it'll depend on whether it's mobile or desktop, how far away that'll space everything. And then we'll do text align center to start with. That'll keep everything in the center. Now this V max works uh, interestingly. Uh, let's actually get a background on here. Let's just do like background of red or something like that. So you can see right here. And what I've done is I've basically set this gap right in between here based on either the width of the viewport or the height of the viewport, whatever is bigger. In this case, the height would be bigger, so it's um, doing it off of that. But as I get larger here, you can see that that actually expands because now it's switched over to using the width of the viewport. So that's a nice way to make it dynamic, especially once you get on mobile devices to use a viewport a unit that actually can work both ways. So you can see that's a nice spacing uh, right there. All right, hopefully that makes sense while we're using that. And I'll get rid of this background color. And we'll add in one more thing. This is just to center everything. Uh, actually, let's leave that background on just so we can see what's going on. So there are a bunch of ways to do this. You can do like margin auto left and right or whatever, but here's kind of a hot shot way to do it. So if you do margin inline uh, and use the max function, you can come in here and calculate based off of the viewport width. So I can say calc. And inside here, I actually want to wrap this again. And we're going to say 100 view width minus 70 rem. So this is like a, basically a, a little over 1100 pixels. And then what I want to do is divide this by two and then give the other option here as 1.5 rem. Now I'll save this, it should update and then I'll show you what I'm doing. So what I'm doing here, and actually I need to do one more thing just so you can see exactly how this is gonna work. Let's remove this for now. And uh, as I expand this thing out, it should take up the full width it's allotted with 1.5 rem on either side. I'll explain why I had to remove those in a second. But all we're doing here is we're basically saying, give me 100% of my view width, and then I want to subtract 70 rem. So what I'm doing is basically saying, let's say it's like, uh, I don't know, um, let's get up to like 1500-ish, something like that, minus 70 rem, which would be this red area, and then divide that by two and give me that on either side of my margin in line, so left and right. So either this is going to be bigger or 1.5 rem will be bigger, and what I want is the bigger of either one. So 100 viewport width minus 70 rem, if it's only like 300 pixels, will be a negative number. So this would obviously be smaller. So it's going to look at this and give me this margin either side. The only time this actually kicks in then is once I get above 70 rem. So once I get above 1100 something pixels, now it keeps everything in the exact middle and splits up either side that margin. So hopefully that makes sense. That's a little bit of a hot shot way to do it, but just to show you kind of a cool use case for this max uh, function. All right, so with that set, let me go ahead and put these back on. And the reason I have to remove this is because display grid place item center is automatically gonna shrink everything to the size here of these children. And the form is only gonna take up so much room. Same thing with this H1. And so for that reason, it's never gonna expand all the way out. So I had to remove that to show you how that margin inline will work. But if you have other things in here, uh, this will actually work just the way you'd expect it to. Okay, let me come back down this way now. And what we're gonna work on next is the input fields themselves. So let's get rid of that background color because that's kind of nasty. <laughs> and then we're gonna work on the inputs. So we'll grab the form. And I always like to set this to display of grid. I think it's just easier to lay out forms with grid personally. And I'll show you some extra special kind of things of setting spans for the children to kind of stretch the full width or take a path or whatever in just a second. Let's set a gap here and we're going to use M's on pretty much everything else because the form itself is going to have the font size set by a global variable and everything now will be based off of that. So if I say like 0.8 M, that will adjust as I change that value up top of my size. Next, I want to say max width here and I'm going to calculate this as well. So I want my calc to be my var uh, size. We'll do something like times 20. So in other words, uh, I want this to basically change depending on the size of my font, how large it can be, how wide it can be. So if I come out here, you can see it's calculating it based off of this uh, variable right up here, 2rem. 
So if I change this to one rem, now the form itself is gonna shrink some. If I change this to like five rem, it will allow it to get quite a bit bigger and then it'll lock in around this size, uh, whatever this would be. For this, all the way over to here. All right, so we're gonna use that calculation basically to set this as we want it to be. 1.5 rem, two rem, I don't remember what I had that at. Okay, let's move back down this way. And after we've set the width of that form element, now let's set the font size, and this should be the same as the global, but just to make sure it's set here locally, I'll set it here as well. And then I want this to be text align left. This also means I probably could have just set that text center on the H1 rather than the whole uh, body, but it's fine. All right, <laughs> next we're going to use padding block, another logical property. This is padding up and down. We'll set this to 0.5M as well. This gives us a little bit more space up here and a little bit more space at the very bottom. Now, we wrapped each of these sections here in a div with the class of input wrapper. So what I wanna do is grab that. And the most important thing to put here would be the position of relative. And the reason is because we're gonna have the label here floating right over here, and it has to be positioned absolute relative to this parent container. Next, I'll say display of grid and then gap a 0.2M. Once again, I'm using M here so that everything is responsive based on that base value. And then we'll use one more logical property. This is margin block start, not black, but block uh, start like this. We'll do 0.6M. This is basically above this right here. So anything with the input wrapper is going to have extra room up top. So margin block is up and down and start means up rather than down. And so that input wrapper is set. Now what I want to do is grab the form labels. Now you may notice that I've got both the placeholders and the labels saying the exact same thing. And the reason is kind of a funky reason. We need to float the label based on whether or not there's something in here. And the only way to do that upon click is to use a pseudo selector called placeholder visible, I think it is. So, or placeholder shown. So what I'm going to do is first of all, come in here and grab the form label and we'll just position this where we want it, and then we'll hide that placeholder here in a second. So I'm going to say text transform, and I want this to be uppercase to start with. And there we go. And then font size here, I want to be 0.7M. This will be relative to the font on the whole form. And I do want this to be spaced out a bit, so we'll say 0.05M. And then margin in line, so left and right. In line like that will be 0.45M. And I just found these values by playing around with what looked good to me. Uh, this, again, I need it to be position of absolute. That's the whole reason for putting it in that parent container. So absolute. And then I'll do a top of 50%. So it goes 50% off the top of its parent container. Now, in order for that to be in the very middle of that input, I need to move it back up. So transform. We're going to translate Y in the Y direction. If I can get it to, Y right there, negative 50%. So go back up halfway, which puts it right in the middle. I do want some padding on this, so let's do padding a 0.1M, and we'll do 0.35M. And I'm gonna set a background color, and it's gonna actually be the same as the input itself uh, once I get around to styling that. So we'll do an HSL wrapping my variable of muted. All right, so let's save that there, and you can see now it's kind of covering up that placeholder text, which again, we'll change in just a second. All right, next, I've got a couple of transitions I wanna add because when I click in there, again, I want the label to float up, so it's gonna to have to translate. And then I also am gonna change the background color to be the same as the background color here, rather than this muted variable. So let's set some transitions uh, for both of those. So it's transition, not transitions. And then I'm gonna actually come down below here just to make it a little bit easier to read. And we'll say on the transform, what I want is to take my variable of speed uh, fast. And then I wanna take my variable of uh, let's see, my type of squish, all right? And then we'll copy this down with shift uh, and option and the down arrow, put a comma in between these. And then now I'm gonna also change my background color, background color. And here I'll keep it at fast and squish. Those should all work just fine. Okay, so I'll save that there and nothing's gonna change too much because we don't have it moving anywhere, but now we're set up on this transition. Now we've got a couple other things to do uh, for the form input. So let's do that next and then we'll get around to the placeholder after that. So I'm gonna grab my form input and first of all, I want border of none and then border radius will be my var of radius. That's one of those defaults we set up up top. I'll add some padding here just so that when I click in here that the cursor is a little bit off to the side here. So let's add that. We'll do like 0.35M and 0.55M. Again, these are just values that I found worked well. Uh, and these M values mean that they're still responsive based on whatever the default 
font is for the entire form itself. All right, now I'm going to come in here and I'm going to add a width of 100%. This ensures that it stretches uh, to 100% and no more, which is important once we get around to stacking these up next to each other and this email address all the way across. Here, I also want the background color to be the same. I want it to be my muted value here. And then I'm going to change one other thing. And if I come in here, maybe let's actually hide this. So we'll say display of none and hide that. And then uh, let me grab this too. And we'll go ahead and add that placeholder um, change here. So placeholder like that. And I just want this to be an opacity of zero. We're actually not going to change that because I want to hide that uh, by default. So if I come back in here and on this background color, let's remove that and click in here. You can see I get this cursor and the default styling of this blue border. Now what I want to do to theme this a little bit more is to make the cursor color the same as my accent color. You can change that with a property called caret color. And I'll change this to my HSL of accent. So now when I come in here and I click, I'm going to get a purple color here. I don't know if you can see that. Um, can you see how purple that is? It's just a little tiny line. I wish you could make those thicker, but you can't currently. I think there is something in the spec. Uh, whether or not it will ever happen, I don't know. But now the even the carrot itself is themed with everything else. Let's come back up here. Uh, let's actually remove this display none altogether. And then inside here, we're going to change a couple of other things. First of all, we'll add a box shadow. And here what I want is basically to have this a background box shadow ready. So where when I click on this, it will kind of pop out. But I want it to be inside and kind of underneath the input to start with. So we're going to add two box shadows to make that happen. First of all, we will add an inner one. It will have zero left and right, zero up and down, zero blur. And then I'm just going to move it internally, 0.1M like that. We'll set this to the variable of background. And then I'll copy this down, put a comma in between. And I want this to be uh, accent. And we'll do a forward slash here, 0.8, to get my 80% opacity. And here I'll change this to like 0.2M, something like that. So I'll go ahead and save that. In fact, maybe let's remove both of these just so you can see what we're doing here. You can see we've got an inner ring. That's this one right here. That's the same as my background color. And an outer ring, that's uh, my accent with 80% opacity. And if I change this to like 20%, you can see how that changes the effect. All right, so back into both of these, what we're going to do is basically pop it between this hidden view and what I just showed you a second ago based on whether or not it's been clicked into or whether it's focused at the current time. All right, so in order to make that a smooth transition, let's add a transition. So this will be a box shadow here, and then my var here will be my slow speed, and my variable here will be squish, or squish, there we go. Let's save that. I'll come down below here and grab my form uh, input. We have that default styling whenever it was focused, which was an outline, and I actually wanna set that to none. So that means if I click in here, I won't get this blue border, which can be kind of dangerous. So what we need to do is replace this with our own custom styling. And inside here, what I want to do is now change something whenever it's been focused. So this will work on either mobile or desktop. What I want is the box shadow. And actually, I'm just going to copy down this right here because we're going to use something very similar. So I'll come in here, paste those in. What we're going to do is make these positive, And I'm going to increase this just a touch, so like 0.2 and 0.4. And that way, if I come in here and click, now I should get this nice snapping effect where it comes out. And you can change the timing of that if you want it to be a little snappier. Uh, but I kind of like it like that, a little bit of a delay, and then it kind of pops right out. So we've got that set, and it also works with keyboard events. So if I come in here and focus it on those, you can see how all that styling works perfectly. All right, now I promised that we would move these up. So how are we going to do this? What I want is two cases. Number one, if I click in here, I want it to move up. And secondly, if I come in here and I type something, I want it to, and I move out of it, I want it to stay up above it. But if I go back to empty, I want it to move back down. So how do we accomplish that with just standard CSS? Well, what we're gonna use is a general sibling selector, which is why I put the input before the label. So let's grab the form input, and we're gonna grab the focus state again. And then using a general sibling selector here, we're going to say the form label that comes right after it. Whenever that has been selected, whenever it's been focused, here's what I want to do to the form label that comes after it. I want to transform it, and I want to translate it 3D. Now, by using 3D, it engages the graphic engine of the computer, so it's a little bit more performant. And I'll just move it up 0.2, let's see, 2.75M like that, and then zero in the Z direction. So if I click here, and now I come over here and I click, should move up just above, which is cool. Now this background color is still the same as the form input itself, and I want it to actually take on the background itself. So I'll come in here, grab my background color, 
And in this case, I want it to be the background. And then I also wanna change the color of the text and I wanna grab my accent and add a little bit of an opacity. Let's do like 0.8 so it matches um, this box shadow right up here. So I'll save that. Now when I come in here and I click, it moves up above and it looks like it's kind of part of that banding, which is pretty cool. Now, the only problem here is if I come in here and add like my last name, now it snaps back down because I'm no longer focused on it. So there's one other use case where I'd want it to actually be staying up above and that's whenever there's anything in here. Now there's a couple options. First of all, let me copy this, do a comma, come down below, paste that back in. Instead of focus, I could do a couple of other things. You might think you could do something like uh, not empty or something like that. The only problem with that is that it doesn't count this as being empty. So if I come in here and move it back down, that doesn't actually work. You might also think, well, I could come in here and instead of not empty, I could do like uh, valid. So whenever there's a valid uh, type in here, uh, then it will move up. Well, the problem is, is nothing is technically valid. And that's how it works on both of these. So that doesn't work either. So this is why we have to have a placeholder. This is a little bit hacky. Maybe you know another way to do this, but I don't. <laughs> but you can use the not function here and say whenever the placeholder is not being shown. And the, the reason it would not be shown is if you have anything in this input. So now if I move it out, it's not shown anymore. And it moves up based on whether or not uh, it has been focused. So right now it moves up because of this first line over here. When I start typing and I add my last name and I unfocus it, now it's going to stay up because of this line right here. So that's a way to get both use cases. So that, we've got that all set now and ready to go. And uh, now we just have a couple of other kind of quality of life improvements. So let's uh, think about stacking these first and last names next to each other with as minimal of CSS as possible. Then we'll also think about the selection color. So if I come in here and select this, right now I've got my default blue, but what I wanna make sure is that it actually matches everything else. Then we'll also add some differences when it comes to the speed of things based on a user's preference, and then a couple other things kind of to pull it all together. So let's first of all come in here and let's add something that will stack these up next to each other and stack this one up and this one up all the way the full width depending on the screen size. So I'm gonna add a media query all the way down here. So we'll say media and screen and min width will be 600 pixels, something like that. So at 600 pixels, which I'm gonna call my medium screen size, I'm gonna add another class down here and we're gonna be inspired by Tailwind if you're okay with that or we'll say medium and then with a the forward slash, we can escape this colon say span two. So in other words, it's the same as writing dot medium span two like that in your HTML. So when we do that, we're going to come in here and I'm going to change the grid column to one over span two. So if you're used to working with grid, basically what I'm doing is saying, hey, start at the first one and then span two automatically. Grid is smart enough to kind of understand that what you mean is you actually want to space out once you get above 600 pixels to where these two are gonna be stacked one after the other. So there's gonna be two columns since I'm spanning two, but this one and this one, which we'll add this class to, will actually go all the way across. So let's save this and I'm gonna show you what I mean. If we come down here, we have two things we want that to be the case for, the email address, which will be right here on this input wrapper and uh, this button right here. So for both of these, I'm gonna say medium span two. If I save it, as soon as I get above 600 pixels, it should snap just like that. If I go back down below 600, now they're stacked all up one on top of each other. So again, I'm gonna move this out this way, perfect. And it should lock in and then I come back down and it snaps back to just stacking them like a little hamburger. And that's all based off of one media query and one little line of CSS, which is pretty cool. And again, Grid is smart enough to understand that once you say, hey, I want this to span to, that there must be two columns. So it stacks these next to each other and anything that has span to takes up the full width like this. All right, so that's the first thing. We also wanna apply a selection. So let me come back up to my top here. Let's do maybe just below the body. And here I'll just do a double colon selection. And this will apply to everything. So it's like a, a global selector here. And what I want is uh, the selection background here to be my uh, accent. And we'll do like 80% opacity again. Something like that. So now if I come in here and I select anything in here, it'll update all that. I also want the text itself to change. Uh, so let's move this down and say that the color should be my background. I'm using background instead of text because I know that my accent color is that dark purple. And here we go, just like that, cool. And just like that, everything should work just fine. 
And we left ourselves a little to do, and that's up top here with prefers reduced motion. So let's come in here and add that media query. So we'll say media prefers reduced motion. Whenever anyone has this set to reduce, what I want to do is grab my uh, variable, my global variable of t speed. And in this case, I want both my slow and my fast. I'm going to set these both to 100. Let's do like 50 milliseconds, maybe. So there will be a slight amount of transitions, but not much. So I'll come back in here, see speed. This is now going to be fast. And I'll set both of these to that. So if I come in here and snap in here, I don't have this enabled right now on my machine. All this should work as normal. But if I open up the dev tools and I hit Command Shift P and run uh, Reduce Motion, and now that should be enabled, and I come in here, and you can see how snappy that is now. So it doesn't actually slowly kind of snap out. It's just real quick and puts it on automatically. You can even set this to zero if you want to have no motion at all. And you can see that that's immediate now when I focus in on these states. Um, that works for everything from the banding to the moving of the text to all of that. You can see if I uh, maybe change this back, like let's say I change this to like, I don't know, 600 to make it really obvious, which this is the opposite of reduced motion, but you can see how everything just slowly moves up. Um, so what I'm doing is accounting for the user's preference on how they want their machine to work. Now we've done all this work and we haven't actually had the satisfaction of seeing how all this works in dark mode. But before we do that, I want to go ahead and paste in some other styles. Now, uh, let's come in. Let's just go maybe at the very, very bottom here. We've done what we came here to do, which is to work on the forums. And I haven't done anything with the button yet. And that's because this has really been about that input field, whether it's text or email, or you could apply this to other things as well, like text areas. Um, but I have done a video recently on creating a new better button default. So I'm going to go ahead and paste in the styles from that exact video. And again, you can grab all this from the code pin. It uses the same principles we've already looked at, but again, it styles it for the button. So if I paste that in there, you see now what we've got is the exact same situation where it snaps out just like you'd expect. Um, you actually get a hover state as well, and there's a nice little uh, gradient background behind all that as well. It's the exact same thing as I've just showed you. It's just doing it for a button instead. You can see this is all the, the CSS right here. So what we've done is here is on focus, we've removed the default outline. We have the snappy background that has an addition to kind of the ring around it. It also has uh, the box shadow now being removed. Uh, when we either ho hover or we come in here and focus on it, but all that is the exact same. All right, now that we've seen all that, let's actually come in here and change it over to dark mode to get the full effect. There it is. And now I can come in here and add like Chris Pennington and do like Chris at codinginpublic.dev. And you can see how all that stays and the styling itself is just so much better than the default. And again, all this is totally customizable. So I can come back up top here and my controlling variables that control everything else. If I get to the very top here, are my hue, my size, my radius, all that kind of stuff. So I could come in here and maybe change this to 20, change this to 2.5, change this radius to, I don't know, 0.6. Uh, I'll leave all the rest of that alone. You can see how that just updates automatically for me. Now, all these radiuses are the exact same, radii. I don't know if it works like that. Uh, you can see how the button changes automatically. I can sw switch to light mode. Same kind of thing happens where I get this nice uh, effect in light and dark mode. Come back up here. Maybe I change this to like 220. We change down to 1.5, back to 2 rem, and now everything snaps to it. And now we've got everything kind of this blue hue for everything. So it's cool when you create these dynamic variables that can control so much, it really just totally changes the experience for you as a developer. Once you set them up once, now, you know, kind of the whole thing's just your playground. You can mix and match them however you want. Well, we've built better button inputs. We've now built better form inputs. There's a bunch more we could do with forms like the selection and checkboxes and a bunch of stuff like that. But I thought I'd keep this as limited as possible. And really this has been an excuse to think about scaffolding out a design system throughout a build. And so I hope you've taken that from it. Hey, well, thanks so much for watching. I really appreciate it. I will catch you in the next one. Happy coding.